I'm Gotham Mukunda. Tonight on Greater Boston. Drug companies are at odds with the Biden administration over plans for Medicare to start negotiating the price of prescription medications. What does this mean for what you pay at the pharmacy? Plus, have labor strikes been paying off for American workers? We'll discuss ahead. Coming soon to a pharmacy near you, lower prescription drug prices. That's the goal, at least, as Medicare takes steps to negotiate prices, starting with 10 medications that cover a wide range of common and serious conditions, including diabetes, heart failure, and arthritis. After a lengthy negotiation process, new prices are expected to kick in in 2026. That is, if lawsuits filed by several of the drug companies behind those prescriptions don't succeed in blocking the process altogether. So, what does this mean for Medicare, its patients, and the rest of us? I'm joined now by Mike Astrew, former general counsel for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and former chair of MassBio, and by Dr. Hussein Lalani, a primary care physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital and health policy researcher with Harvard Medical School. So, Mike, you've actually been on every side of this issue, from pharmaceutical CEO to government. So why don't we start off with you? Is this going to affect prices for consumers at all? Yes, it's going to hurt consumers, actually, in the short run because of some of the changes they're making in Medicare Part D. Uh, the left wing of Congress has never liked the managed care elements of Medicare. And so in part of this whole package, they've stripped that out. And so um, ordinary people on Medicare will probably be paying a little bit more, and they re won't be benefiting from these price reductions because those are really to save money for the, uh, it's to punish the companies primarily, but it's also to save money from a budgetary point of view. So the average American person will not see any financial benefit from this, and will also see, in the, before too long, if it's successful, which I don't think it will be, because I think it's blatantly unconstitutional, I don't think it will get past the courts. But if it does, it will greatly damage the development of innovative drugs the same way 30 years ago, uh, the Clinton proposals to control drugs caused a nuclear winter locally in biotech and shut down most new development for several years. Jose? I, I strongly disagree. I think we've already started to see that the Inflation Reduction Act is lowering prices uh, and costs for patients. I mean, we've capped insulin at $35 per month. Uh, patients aren't paying more than that. It's helping a lot of my patients who have diabetes. And I think, you know, these new drugs that are going to be negotiated, they're accruing savings for a lot of the other features of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the, the most notable of which goes in place in 2025, which, which caps the out-of-pocket cost uh, for the whole year for patients with Medicare at $2,000 per year. That's going to save uh, tons and tons of patients who are currently paying uh, you know, upwards of that, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, especially for expensive cancer medicines. Yeah, I, I think that that is just not going to hold up. The, um, uh, you know, there are going to be tons of patients who are benefiting from the current competition in Medicare Part D, you take that competition away on the drug side and their drugs are going to get much more expensive. So are there going to be some patients that gain? Yes. Are there going to be patients who lose? Yes. Um, and it's going to be, I think, generally a net loss for patients. But you can't credit this act with really doing anything of substance yet. And you can't say because they've already gone ahead and capped insulin prices, which they should have done a long time ago anyway. And that market should have taken care of that, but I think there were uh, inappropriate agreements you know, made. But um, that doesn't um, support the notion that this is gonna be a huge success. You take 10 of the most successful drugs um, that we have on the market now, and you punish the companies for um, having them. And it is absolutely a punitive process. There are no standards. There's no administrative appeal. There's no legal appeal. The only challenge you can make is constitutional. And it's, not, it's, it's, it's a fraud on the public to call this a negotiation process because it's not a negotiation. It's a negotiation the same way that if I snuck up on you in the GBH parking lot, and put a gun to your head and say, give me your wallet or else. That, that is how GBH got its last donation Yes, me. yeah, yes. Um. Um, but the or else is basically the same thing that's happening here. HHS is going to set a price. If you don't like it as a company, you don't have the option 
of not taking it. You have to continue providing the drug. And if you say no, you pay a 95% tax on uh, your revenue from there. Not your profits, but the revenue, which means that most of them would be running these products at a loss. And the consequence of moving so dramatically in that direction, it's going to put a freeze on the ability of small companies to attract the, the, the uh, financing that they need to continue to develop innovative drugs. I, I don't see this as a punishment. I mean, this, th this law allows Medicare to negotiate drug prices for drugs that have been on the market for at least 9 or 13 years. Uh, this is not all new drugs at all. It's a very small sliver of old, older drugs that have been on the market for a while. And what I can tell you is my patients with Medicare still can't afford their medicines. I mean, one in four Americans over the age of 65 cannot afford their medicines. And that leads them to ration their medicines or not take them at all. And, and I'll tell you about one of my patients um, who has atrial fibrillation, a really common heart condition where the heart sort of flutters instead of squeezing. Um, he, you know, that increases your risk of having blood clots. And there are two medicines on, on this list of 10, uh, Zarelto and Eliquis, uh, both of which reduce the risk of blood clots. And, and they cost him $500 a month. And he just can't afford that. And because of the rules that Medicare has in place, he, can't, he doesn't qualify for any of the other programs. Um, he can't use a copay card. He applied for a, the patient assistance program from the drug company, um, and he was denied. And he's left with the $500 bill per month. So, I mean, you can't tell me that it's not going to help him. It's absolutely going to help him. He spends $6,000 a year right now on that drug. I mean, and that'll be capped at, at $2,000, but not until 2025. But if you don't have the drug in the first place, so I, I've taken one of these drugs on, on the list of 10. Um, and there's an arbitrary element, and there's an almost equivalent drug um, that's not on this list. And one of them sells seven and a half billion, and one of them sells five and a half billion. I'm on another drug that's more recent, um, making nowhere near as much money. If this system had been in place 20 years ago, the drug that I'm on never would have been developed in the first place because they would have just given it. said, you know, look, RA is a target. You know, we're just not going to do this. And I've seen this happen. I mean, when I was at Biogen, you know, they dropped their HIV um, product in part because of the pressure to keep the prices down. Um, and it's a shame because it's a product that could have helped people probably if it had been developed on a timely basis. Later, technology was better. So when it finally did start moving along with another company, didn't benefit anyone. But the development pro process is difficult, it's expensive, it's unpredictable. And for this structure to add additional costs and additional unpredictability to it, it is going to damage the development of new products. So if you have friends and relatives with cancer, with serious autoimmune diseases, with rare conditions, this is a real threat to you getting the medicines that you want to have. So, so Mike, I, I would push on this a little bit, right? Because yeah. the tr this is the, exactly the traditional argument that pharma has made against any type of price controls. Yes. And it has economic validity, but like, as an, I would say that a lot of the argument has been damaged by the behavior of pharmaceutical companies, right? Yeah. You mentioned yeah. insulin. Uh, maybe the most egregious is the clear, clear case of pharmaceutical companies that are paying generic competitors not to enter their markets right. in ways that probably should be illegal, but aren't. Yeah. So, if the industry chooses to act in ways that make it seem like it is, at least in some ways, predatory, doesn't that undercut the credibility of the position that, well, we need this to innovate when in, in, the innovation in insulin got done a long time ago? So, so if you know, the, the argument is the industry's done some dumb things, then I agree with that. All right? And I think there are, you know, when I uh, was chair of Mass Bio, I got my, was very unpopular because I kept saying, why are you dumping prices in Canada? You know, you're just, it's not fair. You're going to create a political controversy. If we wanted to regulate drugs by saying you get um, the best price of any developed country, I would be for that. Um, I also think that the last three administrations have done an absolutely crummy job at the FDA on what I think is the most important thing for bringing um, costs down, which is we don't have a real biogeneric industry yet. The FDA culturally has never wanted to do this. There are uh, public citizen places are getting in the way um, to um, the kinds of things that they need to do to have a biogeneric industry. You know, it is not an accident that 
most of these drugs are biotech products because the small molecules, the pure chemicals, are getting generic competition when they go off patent. You're not seeing that in the same way as consistently on the biotech side. Sometimes you're seeing it. And there are some drugs that are products of the old patent system, and that's about ready to cycle out. That creates a problem in terms of when they could go generic. But the single best thing that you could do to bring down drug prices in this country is to make sure that the FDA got its act together and, and put in the regulatory structure and the incentives to have a real biogeneric industry. And then you'd see some serious price reductions. I mean, the main reason we have high prices in the United States is because we allow monopolies. The government grants monopolies to drug companies and allows them to set the prices. And now the government is saying, okay, we're going to control the price in a negotiation for 10 of the drugs. And, you know, the thought that we have, like, every single drug is a blockbuster or a home run is just false. In fact, less than half the drugs are home runs. In a study that we did at, at our research group, Portal, the program on regulation, therapeutics, and law at Harvard Med School, we found that... Of the 50 top-selling drugs in Medicare in 2020, less than half were better than things already on the market. And, you know, this, this is really important because we shouldn't be paying top dollar uh, for drugs that aren't really any better than what we already have. In fact, every other country uh, in the world assesses drugs and their value compared to other, other drugs on the market. And, and yes, let's accept it, right? Drug development is expensive. I don't think anybody's saying that. But, but it's not like the drug industry is doing it all on their own. They're absolutely not. The federal government, taxpayers, they're all contributing to this development in many ways. Preclinical development, the NIH funds nearly uh, every single drug has received some form of NIH funding in the last decade plus. Clinical trials, about a, a quarter of drugs uh, are developed with some government funding. Tax credits, the government gives tax credits, the research and development tax credit, up to 20% of R&D expenses um, in the last three years. And, and the list goes on. And so, you know, there are, it, it's not like this is being done on its own. There, there are, there's a role for government here, there's a role for the drug industry. Look, the, the assertion that the federal government is doing a huge subsidy for drug development is a myth. It's just simply not true. And it's also a myth that NIH original research uh, f spawns a lot of this research, if you, uh, a lot of this development. If you look, for instance, at NIH's royalties, if they were a university, they'd be like 60th in the country. Um, and the amount that they put toward clinical trials is small. It's when it's already a home run that's coming and they want to play at the party. They are not all that significant. And if you're talking about monopolies, I mean, if you mean by patents, some monopolies are important. Patents are important. Orphan Drug Act is important. Without those things, there'd be nothing at all. Um, and there's a reason why Congress passed the Orphan Drug Act um, and it is because there were all these products that were not being developed that they wanted to see developed and it's been enormously successful. So you can say monopoly because people don't like the sound of monopoly, but there's been nothing that's saved more lives in this country in the last 30 years than the Orphan Drug Act and that creates seven-year monopolies to companies and it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Well, monopolies allow drug companies to set prices, right? And so, that, and so when you talk about, you know, how, how are drug prices set? That, that's how they're set. The drug company sets the prices, and sometimes for a very long time. And there, there are abusive patents. And I think one of the drugs on the list here of 10, Enbrel, is a great example. Do you know when that drug's initial patent was approved? It was 1990. Yeah, but that problem, it was 1990. That problem's already been solved. It we, hasn't we, been solved. It has been solved. We changed the U.S. patent system to solve that problem. It's just that's a pre-existing condition. Other drugs going forward are not going to be able to do what Immunex and Amgen did with Embrel or what Amgen did with Epo. It is not possible anymore. We've moved to the European system where it's 20 years from approval, um, no extensions, that kind of thing. This makes a huge difference. And when you factor in the length of time that it takes to develop a drug, probably 13, 14 years on average, there's a going to be a very short window going forward for most companies, not only to recoup their costs for the drugs that are approved, but for all those drugs that don't make it. And if you're actually trying to do uh, serve people um, who are not being served now, you have a lot of failures. Biogen has a lot of failures. You know, um, all the innovative companies have a lot of failures. And so you've got to pay not only for the drugs that, that 
win, but you've got to pay for the ones that don't win. Mike Astru, Dr. Hussein Lalani, thanks for being with us today. From Hollywood writers and actors and UPS drivers to teachers, nurses, and Starbucks baristas, workers and labor unions have had a busy year fighting for higher pay and better working conditions. How have their efforts been panning out for companies and their employees? To discuss, I'm joined by Claire Hammonds, professor of practice at Labor Center at UMass Amherst, and Roy Bahat, head of Bloomberg Beta, an early stage venture capital firm. Claire, how do you assess our summer of labor tumult? Um, well, I think I'd look at a couple of things. I think, you know, for one, we've been seeing more labor activity than we have in many years. And this doesn't just start this summer, right? Even if we look between, you know, 2021 and 2022, we were starting to see these big increases. This past summer, though, I think, as you, you know, your intro mentioned with the writer strike, the actor strike, um, and a couple of big victories from uh, UPS and also American Airlines, we're really starting to see some of those um, some of those organizing efforts and some of those strike preparation efforts really translate into to on the ground gains um, for workers in their contracts. And I think you know what we will wait to see is what happens um, with the big three automakers as they're uh, gearing up for a possible strike that would start next week. Roy, are you seeing um, changes in corporate behavior that are being driven by this increased labor pressure? Um, I think corporations are just starting to wake up to this. I think for decades, business leaders in the U.S. have mostly been able to ignore organized labor because the percentage of people in the private sector who were unionized was so low, below 10 percent, that, you know, a lot of business leaders would tell me that it was kind of like the library. You know, they knew it was important a long time ago. If maybe they respected it. Maybe they didn't care, but they didn't think about it very much. And then with this renewed attention on organizing, not just unionization, but also all kinds of forms of employee organizing. I mean, people passing around spreadsheets, sharing each other's salaries or petitions calling on their company to be more active on a social issue like climate change. There's now a whole toolkit of how to relate to your workforce that business leaders haven't practiced in a long time, and it's time for them to practice it. So how much of this is just a product of, of historically tight labor markets? I personally think very little. Um, I'll be curious what Claire thinks. I mean, we lead this group at the Aspen Institute um, that's called the Business Aspen Business Roundtable on Organized Labor, which is a, a group of business leaders trying to re-examine their relationship with organized labor. And many of them are in industries where the labor market isn't particularly tight. Of course, in segments where it is tight, that can change the conditions. And like many forms of, um, of intense social action, they often happen not when things are getting worse, but when things have been bad for a long time and then they get better and people have a little bit of hope. And so the hot labor market did give some working people a sense that they had leverage. Claire? Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, the, the tight labor market coming out of the pandemic certainly had an impact on this. But I think it's also, you know, it's important to remember that um, there is often a contagion effect with these sorts of things, which is to say that, you know, a lot of the workers we're seeing organized now. Um, I live out in Western Mass in Amherst, right? And we have a, a little strip where we're seeing Barnes and Noble workers organize, Michaels, Trader Joe's, all within sort of a one block period. And a lot of the issues that they're raising with their work about low pay, about scheduling issues, none of those issues are are new. And but we, what we do see is new is that um, workers perspectives on what's possible and what's possible when they organize and the fact that they can win, um, that is a shift. And so this is to say, you know, I think, um, you know, the tight labor market is is a part of that story. But I think once that sort of gets going, um, workers look around and they see the other folks next to them starting to to win contracts. Um, and that and that spurs on additional organizing efforts. So, Claire, yeah, I mean, I, that, that contagion point, I think, is so important. Just a show like this one, you know, propagates the idea. And if you look at who's organizing, it doesn't feel like traditional organizing. I mean, you look at a guy like Chris Smalls, who led um, the Amazon labor union, you know, he's a celebrity. He looks like a celebrity and acts like one. And that creates inspiration for people. I mean, you can find accounts on Twitter that have fashionable union leaders. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that does inspire folks. Plus, 
new folks entering the working class. I mean, the you know the folks who organized at Starbucks just don't look like the people who are striking at an auto factory. They're a different kind of a professional and personal background. And so when people encounter conditions, even if the conditions have existed for a long time, but they see them in a new, fresh way, they get spurred into action. So we've seen upsurges in union membership, but as a fraction of the private sector labor force, union membership has not gone up very much. Is that going to take structural change, or are we going to see unions sort of learn, adapt these new tactics and learn how to recruit members just as effectively as they're learning how to strike better? Claire? Um, well, I don't think it's a matter of just like unions going out and recruiting, right? A lot of this is, is workers themselves starting to come together. Um, and I think that we will continue to see that increase. Um, and I think, you know, we're also seeing some um, some policy changes that are able to support that. There have been a couple of recent decisions from the National Labor Relations Board um, that have been very favorable towards unionization. And I think will open the door um, in the future to to really um, to allow unions to win elections um, and to close some of those loopholes that for a long time have made it possible for employers to act illegally with impunity. Yeah, and personally, I think it's too early to tell. We don't know if how much this will change. I think that what's clear is that whether or not the union membership changes, the percentage of the population, the way that CEOs lead is going to have to change. And we've you know written a magazine article in Harvard Business Review, uh, which is the first time they've had a magazine article about organized labor in 32 years. Um, and it's in the most recent issue. And what we say is that CEOs often have to lead as if their workforce is organized, whether or not it is, because that is what workers are starting to demand. And for years, companies have said to workers, you know, we want you to feel like this company reflects your values. We want it to be more than just a job. And on some level, workers are just taking them at their word and saying, okay, if that's what you want, then this is what I want to see. Um, and uh, and so we, I really think that that leadership skill, and I teach at Berkeley's business school, the most important under-practiced leadership skill for business leaders of the next 20 years might be how to lead an organized workforce. So Roy, you're making me feel guilty. I, I, I published enough of HBR that I should have done something earlier. Um, but but I, I want to push on that, right? So why has it been so hard for so many business leaders to acknowledge that, well, I probably, all the stuff that I've been saying about leadership, about leadership and values and my workers being part of this, it would, you know, people were actually going to listen to me and take it seriously. I mean, I think that business leaders, their role models were mostly monarchs. You know, the people who lead public companies with two class shares and that kind of thing, uh, you know, end up having a, uh, a, uh, a, a sense of inflated power. And so sharing power is just not the kind of thing that comes naturally to them. That's a new skill. So Claire, what advice would you give to a business leader who's trying to lead successfully in this new environment? Uh, well, I, I suppose I would say that they should be aware of what the laws are around workers' rights to unionize. Um, and I, you know, I think a big part of the story of why unions have declined um, so much over the last, you know, since the 1970s um, has been about um, corporations getting very good at both um, stopping unionization efforts um, and breaking unions in, in many contexts. And I would certainly say that for employers going forward, that being aware of what those rules are um, and the fact that that workers do have a protected right to organize in the U.S. Um, and that if that's what workers decide to do, that that's their right to do so. so. So Claire, let me push on that a bit because they need to follow the law is a very low bar, right? So Yet most don't meet it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. right? Um, the, <laughs> the, United States has, the United States had a uniquely violent labor movement and probably has the most antagonistic labor management relations of any industrialized country. So if you were to, for, uh, for both of you, if you were to sort of counsel a business leader and say, maybe that's not the most fruitful way to go forward, what would you tell them to do? I think it's like any other business relationship, which is if you have a counterparty that's powerful, you have to treat them with respect and try to build a relationship. And it is a two-way street. I mean, you know, I've seen cases, I think it, in a fight, it only takes one side to think it's an antagonistic war 
to have an antagonistic war. And so that the, the the tragedy is that can start on either side of the table. And you know, unions for understandable reasons often start an organizing campaign with personal attacks against the CEO. Um, and so that then makes it really hard for that person to enter into a collaborative mindset. So it's a two-way street, but on the business side, you're right that following the law is a low bar. And at the same time, my guess is you've probably jaywalked in the past year because the penalties are not that steep. And you know the National Labor Relations Board, which Claire just mentioned, has one-tenth the budget roughly of the district attorney of the city of Los Angeles, meaning this is a wildly underfunded agency to enforce the laws and the penalties can be fairly modest. And so they have to do it because it's in their self-interest and their long-term self-interest and just innovate and experiment on how to have a healthier relationship. That's basically what we counsel them to do. I, I, I live in Boston. I believe it's actually against the law to not jaywalk here. But I, 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 so Claire, just to end with you, if, if what is the next phase of this labor movement activism that we're seeing? What do you think is going to happen that's going to change the way we think about labor in the next year as, as so much has happened in the last year? Um, well, I guess I would say the next, I don't know if I want to say phase, um, but I think as the as the strength and power of organized labor grows and, and if it continues to grow in that way, um, you know, I think having a, a meaningful sharing of, of power within businesses that allows workers, um, the people who, who do the work um, and who often know it the best, um, to be part of those decisions about how businesses proceed and to really see a, a, a more equal power sharing between employers and workers um, would really be the next sort of step there. Claire, Roy, thanks so much for joining us today. It was great having you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for watching. I'm Gotham Makunda, and good night. Outdoors.